Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lazarus that we hear about in today's parable, he is completely and utterly dependent upon other people around him. He begs for his daily bread. His physical condition is such that he's covered in sores and unable to move freely, it seems. Someone, we're not told who, but someone has laid him at the gate of a certain rich man's property. And like the dogs that come to lick his sores, he, like a dog, is entirely reliant upon, or he desires rather to be fed with the crumbs that fell from this rich man's table. But for all that Lazarus can't do for himself, he teaches us faith. That he trusted God for all good things in this life and for eternal salvation is evident based on what happens when he dies. Angels carry him to the bosom of Abraham. And Abraham, we know from the writings of Moses in Genesis, believed the Lord and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Those who have the faith of Abraham, faith in God's promises, go to the place where Abraham went at his death. Lazarus had nothing at the end of his life. He was entirely dependent upon the mercies of those around him, even if they refused him mercy. And yet, in his anguish, he could have very well cried out the words of the psalm that we sang in the intro. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? But in faith, he would have finished the psalm as well, which said, O oh Lord, I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing it to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. This is how Lazarus teaches his faith. He has nothing. His life is in the hands of his neighbors. And yet, he trusts God's promise of mercy. For whatever he gives in this life, knowing certainly that he will be merciful in the life of the world to come. The rich man, though, in the parable is the, is the complete opposite of Lazarus in nearly every way. He's not dependent upon others. He's independent. He's healthy. He's wealthy. He's not covered in sores. He's covered in purple and fine linen, both kingly and comfortably. He doesn't desire crumbs like Lazarus. He's the one that's making the crumbs at the table. He fares sumptuously every day of the week. He depends upon no one. He relies upon his wealth. David had said in Psalm 62, verse 10, If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. But that's precisely what this rich man has done. He thinks that because he has wealth, he has every good thing. And from a worldly point of view, he's not wrong. But having set his heart on riches, relying upon them the way that he does, he has made his riches his God. He's turned his wealth into an idol. He expects every good thing from it. If I have wealth, then I must have everything that I need. And more so, he would say to himself, if I have this wealth, or rather since I have this wealth, this is a sure sign that God loves me and is gracious and favorable to me. Well, he dies, and he does not get an angelic escort. He finds himself rather in the torment of Hades, and there he realizes that he was wrong. Wealth isn't a sign of God's grace and favor. He may very well have been a descendant of Abraham, but he was not a true son of Abraham because he did not believe the Lord and was thus not accounted righteous in God's sight by faith. Because in his earthly life, he thought he had no reason to trust God's promises. Wealth had provided him with all that he needed for his body and life, and so he blinded himself to the reality that... Spiritually speaking, before God, he was just as much a beggar as Lazarus ever was. Look at how beggarly he does now in Hades. He had been, or, uh, he had been laid outside the gate of paradise. And now, the formerly rich man begs Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He who thought he needed no one's mercy in this life cries out for it in hell. And the mercy that he wants is specific. He wants Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and bring it to him to cool his tongue. But think 
think about this for a moment. The resurrection of the body on the last day has not happened yet when Jesus tells this parable. The rich man's body, Jesus tells us, was buried. And death is the separation of the soul from the body. And so this is torment within his soul that he's experiencing. This is the torment of conscience. The flames of this torment are the fact that he is fully aware of his sins and of his sinful nature. The mercy that he cries out for is a physical water to douse physical fire for just a moment. The mercy he seeks is just a modicum of forgiveness of a clean conscience from the guilt and shame of his sin. It's just a moment of relief from that. Now he's the one begging, though. And just as Lazarus's cries for mercy were not answered in his life, now he is denied a drop of water from the table in paradise. What did Jesus tell the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the rich man asks for that which he can no longer have. He neglected the living water in his life, and so he's setting his heart on the gospel of riches instead. And now the time for crossing over that great chasm from death to life is past. Jesus says in Matthew or John 5 24 most assuredly I say to you he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but he has passed from death to life comprehending that one must cross over then from spiritual death to spiritual life during earthly life he then pivots and he begs again, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But that won't do either. One doesn't cross over from spiritual death to life by seeing someone they knew to be formerly dead raised from the dead. If they did, then let's be honest, everyone would be a Christian. Because Christ Jesus is alive, having been raised from the dead. Now, the formerly rich man's brothers, they wouldn't be persuaded by Lazarus. After all, they despised Lazarus in his life. Why in the world wouldn't they despise him if he came back from the dead? They have God's word written in Moses and the prophets. And what did Jesus tell his disciples about Moses and the prophets after his resurrection? He said in Luke 24, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Moses and the prophets testified to Jesus. So to close one's ears to Moses and the prophets is to close one's ears to Christ, the one who has died and yet lives. As the rich man denied Lazarus' begging during his earthly life, now Abraham denies the formerly rich man's begging in Hades. Yes, Lazarus in all of this teaches us faith. For by faith in Christ, though he had nothing in this life, he was spiritually rich, awaiting the promised inheritance with the saints in light. His utter reliance upon others for daily bread, that's a picture of how faith is utterly reliant upon the triune God for every good gift for this life and for every perfect gift, every good spiritual gift from Christ that he has earned for us. Before God, we are all beggars, being covered with the sores of original sin in our flesh, unable by our own reason and strength to believe in Christ Jesus or come to him. And yet, as beggars, God is merciful. For he says to us in the person of his Son, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he gives us contrite hearts to acknowledge our sin, our spiritual poverty, our inability to earn God's favor, and our utter unrighteousness. And then, he creates faith in our hearts so that we may know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, as St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, that though he was rich, 
Yet for our sakes he became poor, that through his poverty we might become rich. Lazarus had nothing, even as we, apart from Christ Jesus in this life, have nothing. But God is rich in mercy, and has, through the gospel, made you rich in spiritual blessings, joy and peace, righteousness in God's sight, the promised inheritance of the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of that everlasting inheritance with the saints in light. This is how Lazarus teaches us faith. The rich man, on the other hand, we have something to learn from him as well, though. He teaches us love. Not by being an example of love, but by rather being an example of what not to do, or what love doesn't do. He shows us the love that he, what would have been done for Lazarus if he had faith in his heart. How does John say it? If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar, for he does not love his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this is the commandment we have for him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. If the rich man had loved God with faith, he would have loved Lazarus, who was at his gate in word and in deed. He would have helped the poor man. As he was able, he would have fed him with the crumbs from his table, and not even crumbs, but as he was able, would have invited him to his table and cared for him in his body. The rich man teaches us that we who believe the gospel, we who are made spiritually rich by faith in Christ, that we also then ought to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And what does love for one another look like? Well, that depends on who they are to you, who you are to them, and what their need is. Love looks different in different vocations, in different relationships, but no matter what, in the specifics, it always suffers long and is kind. It does not envy, it does not parade itself, it is not puffed up, it does not behave rudely, it does not seek its own, it is not provoked. It thinks no evil, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Since God the Father has shown us poor beggars, us poor Lazaruses, such love in sending his only Son to bear our sin and be our Savior, as well as providing our daily bread, how ought we to live towards our neighbors, especially those whom are our brothers and sisters through faith in Christ Jesus. How do we live towards them? In love, as we have ability and opportunity. And if anyone doesn't have ability or opportunity, just as Lazarus had neither in his life, then may that one receive their brother's charity in a spirit of gratefulness and rejoice that though you have not to give, God has so graciously given to you through your brother. And through you, he has given your brother an opportunity to practice Christian charity as well. For in the giving of Christian love and the receiving of Christian love, let it be as ones who have been made rich by Christ's poverty, as ones who are sons and daughters of God, who now, living in his faith, await the promised inheritance with the saints in light. Amen.